Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday Evening Bible Study. Get your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 12. If you have our workbook reading material, it's on page 115. And we'll get started in just a minute. But as we always consider that question, what's God done in your life this past week that's been a blessing to you that you could share with someone? Another little simple thing, uh, this past weekend, uh, the young people had a Super Bowl party on Sunday evening and watched the football game and played games in the Family Life Center and then had a devotion and Bible study at halftime. And so after our evening worship service for the older folks over in the main auditorium, uh, I went over and kind of crashed the party. And as you might imagine, I was the oldest guy there. And one of the funny things that I thought happened while I was there for the short time I was there was that uh, there was some trivia questions asked. Who won Super Bowl such and such? Who won the Super Bowl last year? And all the things like that. And so then they, I think that the question was, who won the first Super Bowl? And I think they said that the first Super Bowl was in 1968. And of course, most of the people in the room weren't even born at that time. And they said, anybody remember that? And so I was the only one that raised my hand. I said, yeah, that was the year I graduated from high school. And so it's one of those things where I was the oldest guy there. And however, there are a few times, not very many, but a few times where we have get togethers at church that I'm not the oldest one. And one of those is coming up this Thursday. Once a month, we have teenagers uh, luncheon, and uh, so I'm not the oldest one at that one. So it's, but we had a good time and the kids had a good time. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter number 12 or the reading material chapter number, or rather uh, page number 115, we'll get started in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Remember last week, we looked at what we refer to as the hall of faith, a bunch of names that came from the Old Testament. <clears throat> and a few references to what we might think of events or people in the New Testament, that because of their life and the faith that they had and their testimony, their names were included or references made to them in chapter 11 of Hebrews that we normally refer to as the Hall of Faith. So we come to verse one of chapter 12, and it's kind of carrying on that, that thought about the people that have gone on before us. So in verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, <clears throat> who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So these first two verses are pretty heavy verses. We're running a race. It's not a dash. It's not a 100 meter dash or a 100 yard dash. It's the Christian life like a marathon. And we need to pace ourselves. <clears throat> we need to be able to be in shape and in a condition where we can finish the race. I've run one marathon in my life back in 1988. And uh, I think it's the closest I ever came to hallucinating <laughs> the last two miles of that race. People talk about hitting the wall and, and that's what I did. And I did finish, but by the time that I got to the end of that race, I was thinking about cheeseburgers and snicker bars and peppermint ice cream. And it was almost like I could taste them. And uh, so I, I was glad to finally see the finish line. But I think Paul would have us to understand that the Christian life is an endurance. He says that, first off, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. I don't think that we should consider that there's people in the grandstands cheering us on, but rather these names of these people who have gone on before us that we read about in chapter 11 last week. 
they are an example to us. They are a witness to us of people that fought the good fight, finished the race, and they did it with a great testimony and in good faith. And that would be this cloud of witnesses that we're surrounded by that have gone on before us. But he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance or some translations may say patience. And it means to run with consistency, the race that is set before us. And that word race there comes from the Greek word agon, from which we get the word agony. And so his idea that he's getting across, the writer of Hebrews, that we're running a race, and it's not just a quick thing, it's a lifetime race for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the kingdom. And that we're to lay aside anything that would be a hindrance to us making good time or finishing the race. A lot of times people, when they train, and uh, I've jogged a lot of miles in my life, and uh, normally you, when you're training, you'll wear heavier shoes with greater support. But if you ever get into a race, especially elite runners, which I'm not, but the elite runners, when they get into a race and time is important, they will put on racing flats or racing shoes that will have less support and will weigh less and that they won't be wearing coats and long pants and things like that. Uh, even if the weather's cold, uh, they will just have a singlet or a shirt and shorts in their shoes and that's it because they want to lay aside everything that would be a hindrance to them doing their very best. And that's the idea <clears throat> that the writer of Hebrews is telling us here to lay aside anything in our lives that would be like heavy clothing to a runner. Lay aside things that might be involved in sin or wrong living that would hinder us from finishing the race of the Christian life. And then it says to have us look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He's the originator of our salvation, and we are to keep our eyes upon him like uh, keeping our eyes on the prize or the finish line. The author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him. Sometimes that might be a little bit difficult to imagine. Jesus came to die on the cross, and yet it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So what might that joy be? To me, it can be explained by some of the words that Jesus said in his prayer. In John chapter 17, the night that he prayed uh, prior to his being arrested in the garden. And I want to read a few verses from that, that prayer in John chapter 17. Thinking about this joy that was set before him. And in verse 5 of John chapter 17... This is the portion of that prayer where he was praying for himself. And he said, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And then I want to drop down to verse number uh, 20 of chapter 17. And this is the third portion of that prayer uh, where he prays for all believers who will believe in him because of the words and the testimonies of the apostles, which would include you and me. He said, I do not pray for these alone, those apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I and them, and you and me, that they may be being perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. One of the great joys, I think, that Christ had before him in him keeping his eyes on the finish line, on the goal, on the prize, is that opportunity that we'll have 
with him to sit down with all who have trusted in him one day in heaven for all of eternity and enjoy one another's uh, fellowship and presence. We come to verse number three in chapter 12 of Hebrews. <clears throat> We're going to see this particular subject of discipline brought out. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Jesus, remember, is our supreme example in everything in life. Consider him who endured such hostility <clears throat> from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. That was a quote from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. There's a lot of good verses in Proverbs chapter 3. Probably the most readily remembered verses from Proverbs 3 is, uh, Trust in the Lord, and lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. 5 and 6 are the verses. But here in verses 11 and 12, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. What we're going to see here is that if we ever realize that we're never rebuked or chastened or disciplined by the Lord, it may mean that we don't really belong to him. He says, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten or discipline? But if you are without chastening or disciplining, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he, speaking of the Lord, disciplines us for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful at the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. <clears throat> and it allows us to have that close fellowship with the Lord. We come to verse 12 through 17, and the subheading in the reading material says, Renew your spiritual vitality. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. When I read that, I think about we're not supposed to be spiritual crybabies. <laughs> And make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. <clears throat> Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which <clears throat> no one will see the Lord. <clears throat> Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this, many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Remember, Esau was the twin brother of Jacob. In fact, Esau was the older one, and he should have received the family blessing, which means he would have got a double portion of the inheritance. But not regarding it with any respect, he sold it to his younger brother Jacob for the price of a meal. He said, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently <clears throat> with tears. We come to verse 18. For you have not come to the mountain. This is going to be a reference back to when Moses and the people <clears throat> who had left Egypt got to Mount Sinai. And there was quite an event that took place there. He said, you've not come to the mountain that 
may be touched and that burn with fire and blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. They were fearful when they heard God's word for they could not endure what was commanded and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. God told Moses to tell the people to stay away from coming up the mountain when he came down on the mountain to speak with Moses. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come, in verse 22, now he's going to contrast that to these people that he's writing to, uh, these Hebrews, he said, you have come to Mount Zion, and he's going to be looking even out into the future to what I believe is a reference to the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, <clears throat> to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks of better things than Abel. Remember, Cain and Abel, way back in early chapters of Genesis, each brought an offering to the Lord. Abel brought an offering from the flock, which was a lamb, which meant it was a blood sacrifice. Remember that back in uh, chapter 9, we read that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Cain brought an offering also, but his was produced from the field, and it had no blood sacrifice involved in it, and his offering was not accepted. But Abel's was respected and accepted by God. <clears throat> and in fact, we read that Abel, even though he's now dead, still speaks and still has a testimony that he brought an offering that was pleasing to God. But here the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks of better things than even that sacrifice that Abel brought. And I want to go back and read from chapter nine in Hebrews. And I'm going to read uh, beginning at verse number 11 through 15 about this blood of Christ and him taking it to the heavenly sanctuary. It says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer that's that red heifer that has become a popular subject these days. Sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he's the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the inher eternal inheritance. So when we come back to chapter 12 in regard to Jesus' blood being compared to the blood of the sacrifice offered by Abel, the writer of Hebrews said, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks of better things than that of Abel. We come now to the last portion of this chapter, verses 25 through 29, hearing a heavenly voice. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape, re escape who refused him who spoke on the earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Remember way back in the first chapter of Hebrews, it said, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the worlds. Here, he's talking about people did not escape when they heard 
God's word or Jesus' word when he was here on the earth. How much more shall we not escape when he speaks to us from heaven? And he's done that through his word, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates a removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Sometimes we read verses in the Bible that talk about the things that are seen are temporal, while the things that are unseen are eternal. We can see our bodies, we can see uh, the things around us, we can see the things on the earth, and the Bible teaches us that they're all temporal, that the earth will be replaced with a new heaven and a new earth. These bodies, these temporary tents, as Paul spoke of them, tabernacle, uh, will be replaced with a heavenly resurrected body like what Christ had. So he says, <clears throat> The things that are made will be shaken, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. The Bible teaches that there would be two judgments of the earth, one by water, that took place at the flood. The other one by fire, and that will take place at the end of the tribulation period, at the end of the millennium, when there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Mount Sinai shook and the people were afraid. The book of Revelation says that in the tribulation period, God will bring about such an earthquake on the planet earth that all the mountains and the islands will be removed out of their place but God's kingdom cannot be shaken and he will bring about a new heavens and a new earth and his kingdom will last forever. Well, next week we'll be looking at the last chapter in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 13. There's some interesting verses in that chapter from the very beginning of it. So if you'd like to read ahead, you'll get an idea of some of the things we'll be talking about next week. Father, thank you for today and the many blessings that you've given. Thank you for the encouragement that you give us in your word. As we read about a lot of people whose names were mentioned last week in chapter 11 of the Hall of Faith, and that then we are encouraged by what we read in this chapter 12 to take notice of those people who lived and died by faith and that we might also lay aside the things that would hinder us from running a race with success, that we might run with endurance the race that is set before us. Thank you so much for those who join us online. We pray that you would bless them, keep them safe and in good health. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at Thursday Bible Life today. Have a good evening. Lord bless you.